we should, okay, we're, uh, uh, while we're waiting to go live, we can let everyone in for the first project and start uh, the screen share of the title slide, Grace. Mm -hmm. Okay, good morning and welcome to the May 24th Public Design Commission meeting. If you're watching on YouTube, please take a moment to read the video description uh, below the video where you will find a link to the meeting agenda with presentations for the committee and public hearing items, along with instructions for participating in the public hearing. If you would like to testify on the public hearing items, please sign up and then wait until the project that you would like to testify on has been announced before joining the meeting. Instructions for signing up to testify and joining the meeting are in the video description below the video. Okay, Signe, we can start. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Signe Nielsen, president of the Public Design Commission. We'll now begin the, the meeting with a roll call to confirm commissioner attendance. When I call your name, if you could please say here. Phil Ahrens. I know you're here. He waved. I know he's there. I think he said here. Okay. Uh, he's oh, here. Right. Ken Seth Armstead. Here. Lori Hawkinson. Is it? Deborah Martin. Here. Our newest member, Karen Keel. Here. Manuel Miranda. Here. Susan Morgenthau. Let me see here. I'm here. Oh, great. Um, Ethel Sheffer, I think, is in transit at the moment, but we'll be back. Uh, Meryl Tisch. Here. And Mary Valverde. Here. Excellent. Um, so we'll now uh, commence uh, with the committee meeting, and it'll be a presentation uh, entitled Memory of a Forest, and it's a percent for art installation at EMS 17 in the Bronx. We'll not be hearing any a public testimony on this. Uh, so uh, team for EMS, please begin. Blaine, I, <coughs> Blaine, I believe I gave you um, control, so Great. you should. Okay, thank you so much. <coughs> Do I have to uh, click? Here we go. So I'm Blaine Desanqua, I'm the artist, and thank you for this opportunity to present um, the conceptual design presentation. So for time, oh. whoop, let's see if I can. Sure. Uh, here we go. So I'm trying to take the controls of Vance and what am I doing wrong here on the ship? There should be, I think, a window that pops up like confirming that you want to take remote and then yeah. you should be able to scroll through. Yeah, it says you can control and it's not letting me and stop control, use my keyboard, check full screen. Sorry about this. Um, we did a test the other day. We did practice this, folks. <laughs> there you go. Always <laughs> right, oh, something. Oh, there we go. Okay, so it was a delayed reaction. Sorry, everybody. No worries. Here we go. Okay. So um, again, thank you for the opportunity. So this is a sampling of some previous works that I've done before. My work is about landscape and uh, trying to reach the viewer and the public. And I'm having the narrative of the visual conversation through the landscape. And they're very site specific. They're driven by social, environmental, political issues. <clears throat> this piece is about 80 feet long. Um, it's called Broken Landscape. This piece was originally installed on the uh, East River in Queens. Um, it's uh, a collage together, extinct uh, mountain ranges in West Virginia and Ohio and blocks out the uh, Manhattan skyline elevated above the East River. And uh, this is called, um, <clears throat> it was installed the entitled Our Fair Miami. 
And uh, it's called High Rise, and it's a conversation about uh, the fragmentation of the Everglades, what's happening with the architectural components, and it's very precariously put together. It's about 14 feet high. Um, this I just recently completed. It was in Charlotte at the arena. Um, it's a visual conversation, this relief, sculptural relief piece about um, an historical dome that was built in 1954, the first freespanding one, and wrapped into it is a typographical landscape, and embedded into that is um, a visual list of all the uh, famous uh, people that participated there through the venues. And uh, you can see I took the architectural renderings. It's a sense of sunrise and sunset and the blue panels. And this is a piece also that just, <coughs> excuse me, been finished in Miami at a new hospital, um, the Jackson West. And uh, it's very close to the Everglades and we're trying to bring uh, a sampling of the environment that surrounds this hospital in, and it's a terrazzo inlaid. It was a collaborative piece with Ellen Harvey and me. And so what you have is the, um, the trees here, and then set into the middle here is a mirror image. The, the veins of the marble goes horizontal, one goes vertical, and it's compressed. So it's almost like looking through the water one side or the other. And then there's a series of um, herons and all kinds of birds flying through the uh, and um, I do a lot of plein air where I go into unreachable spaces, uh, landscapes to try to bring back that information to the viewer. And in this case, I'm in the Gobi Desert. And uh, what you see behind this crate is actually a copy of the landscape. So I re-render these, put them in the crate and ship them back. And I like this whole notion of bringing the outside inside to the viewer and um, the opportunity for them to have a sampling of these far reaching landscapes, they wouldn't normally have the opportunity saying. Um, this is a, a recent installation at my Mass Mocha show that's up until September, 2021. If you uh, have an opportunity to see it, it'd be great. I appreciate it. So um, I spent a lot of time in the high Arctic uh, examining what's happening with climate change, working with scientists and these kinds of important crossovers. And this is a typographical study a re-rendering, kind of a hybrid of flying over the Arctic, which is a Pelico of islands uh, that are snow covered and ice covered. Um, this is called hollow ground. You can see the kind of scale that I'm dealing with here to try to bring the viewer into the environment. And uh, it's fragmented this way intentionally with these holes. Um, I'm trying to uh, give them a sense of what's happening with the permafrost, with the melting and uh, <clears throat> the dissolving of the ice under the layers of the earth. So people can see top, below, above. There's two balconies in the space to also give it another visual access to the piece. This is called Alchemist Triptych. <clears throat> I apologize. Um, and this is kind of a hybrid in the Floor below, there's uh, three holes that there's a continuation of these kinds of columns of tornadoes that go down. So I'm looking at pit mines where historically the main pit mines that were uh, everything from diamond to coal to uh, copper was pulled from these. So these are the positive that are pulled over them and elongated and um, it's um, kind of wrapping into an element of nature, tornadoes and the, the um, armatures on the wall are trying to stabilize it and the chains are trying to hold it like a puppet. And uh, this is kind of a fun piece, but it's not really. It's um, a large uh, train and I'm trying to use that as a vehicle to bring people into the conversation of climate change. So you have these beautiful landscapes that are morphing down into what's happening with climate change as the train goes by this visual narrative. And now we're gonna jump into the project. I apologize talking very quickly, but there's 10 minutes to go through 48 images. So um, there's a series of three cases in this proposed pieces. And what I was looking at closely is two things. One is the history of the Bronx. And I'm trying to relive the 
what the original forest used to look like in the Bronx and present it to the park and uh, the public and the EMS workers that were there. So what you can see is a pedestrian streetscape visually accessing the lobby inside the EMS station and a viewer looking deep into the forest. These forests will also be installed in these uh, infinity boxes, which the viewer looks through it hits a two-way mirror and hits a mirror inside. So what you end up is um, looking at these forests that will be millions of acres. It'll look like it goes on forever, hence infinity. And um, this is the sighting of the location in the Bronx. The streetscape. the back of the parking lot, I believe that's the existing fire station. And this is the top view, the location, the EMS station 17. And um, this site's one of the two locations for these, um, the artwork uh, on the lobby and facing the streetscape, the pedestrian traffic. And the other one will be on the second floor, more accessible to the activities and the staff within the EMS station 17. And then the breakdown of the proposal. So um, it's researching their Bronx history, what was there before um, the urban development. And I'm using nature as uh, healing um, because these EMS workers come back after um, um, very heroic, um, um, you know, saving lives and, uh, you know, um, helping people through great trauma and they're also traumatized themselves or they need um, meditative space. And um, what I'm doing is using nature as this vehicle for that uh, opportunity for these uh, heroic workers. So this is the uh, Thane uh, Family Forest, which is located in the Bronx. It's a 50 acre pot that was put aside uh, and actually represents what was there before the Bronx again became an urban developed area. And I'm gonna use that as a research station to understand the selections of trees, which ones I should pull from, the discussion of maybe one might be winter, one might be spring, one might be summer inside the cases. So it creates a peace, calm and meditative space for the viewer. It celebrates the early history of the Bronx and it's truly an artwork of place. And again, um, it allows the emergency medical personnel, staff, administration as a place to go for solace, calm, and peace. It stimulates also memory and enables the viewer to associate the personal positive times in nature. All of us, if we have a bad week or otherwise, are always looking to escape in nature for the weekend and have an opportunity to rest uh, mentally. And uh, this gives you a better idea of its location again. Um, you can see the street cascape through the uh, casing. One of the cases will be actually on the streetscape. The other ones will be visually tied and aligned inside the lobby. Here we go again, sorry. Oh. And the viewer looking inside one of these infinity boxes. So again, it'll be a strong sampling of what existed in the uh, original uh, forest in the Bronx. Uh, individual passing by, visually accessible to the public. And then uh, a little bit of the breakdown of the door frame and how it's placed on the outside. And I'll be working with Allied. Allied will be doing the uh, uh, initial design of um, matching the uh, components that surround the casing itself of the artwork to the door frame and the architecture. Um, so there'll be accessible panels within these cases themselves. Uh, there'll be LED lighting systems that'll be two foot by four foot, two of them over each one of these cases that are eight feet long. And um, so the life of the LED lights will be anywhere from, um, you know, five to seven years. 
Um, they'll probably be longer because there'll be uh, controlled dimmer situations put on timers. Um, Allied Works will be installing uh, outlets uh, built into the walls themselves that'll make it easier to put a timing system. And when these um, <clears throat> back wall cabinets are removed, um, the individual will be easily sliding the LED panel out and replacing with another one. Now, all of these, some of the early images saw the architectural rendering show the cases uh, outside the wall. I'm working with Allied, who has been uh, shot of absolutely terrific, and we're going to build all the cases into the wall um, for aesthetic reasons, and they'll be flush to the architecture inside. And you can see the kind of breakdown with the LED and the sampling. And again, so what you have is the viewer looks through a two-way mirror, which is clear, and then they don't realize they visually hit a mirror, which reflects back upon the mirror image of the two-way and creates the infinity boxes within. And some details, what we're doing is discovering of how the assemblage with certain kinds of rubber adhesives and the casings themselves and flush mounting them to the interior walls. The LED lighting systems that we've been placed on the top, which will provide beautiful even lighting and they're also uh, natural lighting, uh, the way that the, uh, the design is and uh, some of the components that are all be tempered glass um, the two-way, the mirror, and the glass itself, and some of my studies in the studios, trying to create some of these um, miniature world environments. And back to the streetscape of the pedestrian uh, coming by the, the, the facade. Now the materials that these will be constructed out of are not natural materials, it's a mixture and they're all archival glues that I've used. And to give you an idea, the early piece you saw, which was Broken Landscape was constructed in 2007 and nothing's deteriorated. The paint, um, none of the uh, miniature trees or the cliffs or the landscape is altered at all. Um, <clears throat> And a lot of these earlier dioramas that have been studies and uh, copied, you might say, from the masters have been around some 1966. And I'd be happy to answer more questions about that. So there we go. Whoop. I'll stop right there at this image. Thank you. Thank you. That was <clears throat> an excellent presentation. Um, so just a reminder, commissioners, we're not uh, voting on this today, but Happy to hear any uh, thoughts you might have. Hey, Blaine, how are you doing today? Hi, thank you. Good. Yourself? I'm great. <laughs> I'm great. Thank you so much for this presentation. I, I really in, in, enjoyed seeing uh, the, the thought process in this work. And I, and I also wanted to sort of know, you know, if you had considered I mean, I, I recently was at a uh, an event, and uh, the the uh, invocation from the event was from uh, a leader of the Lenape people. And so, one of the things you discussed, and this is like a week ago, that you know New York was always inhabited. It was a, a, a vital trading port, and, and and in fact, super densely populated before there was an urban uh, European environment. So, what's interesting to me is that you do have the the forest, which would have been before a sort of European urban environment, but is there a way that you uh, are considering the, the Lenape people who would in fact have been densely populated in the Bronx uh, as, as they were all in through the five boroughs? Um, that's a great question. So um, um, respectively, right now I'm working on a project in the high Arctic with uh, some scientists and the indigenous population up there. So very respectful of you bringing that forward. The difficulty sometimes with these projects that I'm doing, as soon as I put uh, wildlife or people or habitats, it, it, it shifts into a different kind of um, 
uh, narrative or diorama in a natural history museum. And I want to be very cautious of that balance back and forth. And part of this project that I'm presenting is kind of a, a dual presentation of really trying to address, um, I feel like saying that respectively, the trauma the EMS workers go through and letting them bring their own memory and connection points to nature into this. And also a uh, bit educational what the, uh, um, the, the, um, the species and the plantings and what the Bronx used to look like. But since you brought that forward, uh, I'm gonna do some research and look into it. I mean, uh, I was actually a year and a half ago at a convention meeting and I met two of um, um, people that were part of those original, you know, their, their ancestors related to those previous tribes and it was Manhattan and they were discussing the fact my people used to live here. And yeah, um, it's hard to weave those kinds of narratives in there, but um, I appreciate you bringing the conversation forward and um, let me think a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, um, I, would, I would also want to um, second that, um, Ken said, um, it is really always important to acknowledge the land, um, original land of uh, people. And um, it's really curious you're saying that it does bring you into a museum or archeological vantage point. Um, but because your project itself is of a train, it is this. It is of a train that is collecting, um, e even if it's not literal, but conceptual ideas of the landscape that was there, and it's bringing it into an interior space or a space that is contained for other people to view in a, in a, in a um, sort of out of context space. So that's literally what is what it is that archaeologists do and bring to museum spaces. So um, perhaps a conversation with uh, art historians uh, of that's of um, that are directly related and understand the Lenape people or the people, the original people of, of the Bronx would give you a different um, perspective on perhaps the sensitivity of the project in general. And maybe maybe it's not introducing images of people in the space, but it, it's, it may be something as simple as acknowledging in the text, the original people and acknowledging um, that history alongside the um, climate change history of the physical space, because ultimately um, indigenous people believe that the land is alive and it's part of um, our own uh, living system. So it, I think it doesn't, it makes sense to acknowledge them as well. Okay, um, oh. you know, I, I hear you strongly. And Ken, if you had any contacts with, um, you know, any of the representatives from those tribes, I would appreciate that. Do you, uh, that you could email them? Uh, I think I could. Uh, but I also like, um, I also wanted to, because uh, kind of Mary picked my brain there, and I want to support that idea entirely that even if you don't change the entirety or any of the, what your plan is for the interior, that there is contextualization about the fact that the land looked this way because people who were densely populated decided it would look this way. It was, mm -hmm. it, yeah, I, it's, I, it's a natural system that had uh, a human system that was impacting it, but in a very particular kind of way, different than the Europeans who now have done what obviously is the Bronx and, and beautiful in a different way. So uh, yeah, I definitely, uh, I, I definitely can forward to you the the name of the, uh, the 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 chief who had done the the invocation benediction at the Whitney, uh, though I'm not uh, I'm not personally connected to, but I could I could forward you the information. So that'd be great. That'd be great. And I support that. I can work with the city. Um, certainly, when they put the plaque and the narrative out there, and I like to investigate. I mean. Over the decades of me doing this work, I'm very cautious about because sometimes you can disrespect a culture of people by miniaturizing certain aspects. But there's many ways I can rethink about weaving the narrative into it. So thank you both so kindly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I mean, I don't. I, I think their your work is really beautiful, and I also really respect the fact that you want to create this space for people who deal with trauma daily 
that is not going to revisit trauma, even the social trauma of the erasure of the native people. And so you have to sort of deal with that delicately. So I totally appreciate that as content that, but it still, you know, has to be addressed. No, thank you so, so much. Thank you both, both of you. Um, I just, I had a question. If I was wondering if you could talk more about the interior space too, and who goes in there because I mean, my office actually did an EMS station. So I know that the public doesn't necessarily go in here because the car, the vehicles are called out places, right? Um, but is this, this is where the staff enters. I mean, they come in and out of their vehicles and they're in the, the vehicle bay, right? The apparatus bay and they move into the, so who is it? I mean, I'm sure some public goes in, but who interacts with this interior piece? I should probably let the city step in, but I'm going to tell you right now that this I've opened up the brick on the left hand side in the front here to let the pedestrian visually access the artwork and show it as best I can. So is a representative here from. Um, so does the public go through that door, I guess, as I assume they do, as well as the staff? That was my question. This is the main entrance in, both staff, administration, and otherwise. Whether it's a public access lobby, it's an open lobby, mm -hmm. I don't have that answer. Hi. Um, Sorry, Blaine. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, this is Ir Yes, hi. Hi, How Irma. Are you? Irma, we work hi. with Irma. Great. Yes. <laughs> hi, Lori. Hi. So, um, the, the short answer to the question is that uh, Blaine very artfully um, split the ground floor level uh, installment to be at the street face of the building so that anybody who passes by can interact and have that moment of quiet in front of the forest. And the architects, Allied Works, are in incorporating um, the, I guess it's the storefront where you can see into the lobby. but. As you remember from when your firm designs the EMS station up in the Bronx, the building is not open to the public. And so right. for this percentage for art, it is for the public to enjoy as well as for the EMTs uh, to uh, enjoy as well. So that's why we split it up. And the one that is the portion of the artwork that's gonna be on the second floor, obviously is exclusively for the um, uh, people who use the building, but the building is not open to the public. I was also thinking just in reference to your question um, to uh, uh, the artists, um, you know, there is the, the Smithsonian Museum down at Bowling Green that could be a, a source if you were interested. Yeah, I wanted to um, agree with Laurie. There's so many, there's so many ways to just access um, specialists and people who are uh, well versed in the history of Indigenous people, especially in New York. That would be my first choice to go mm -hmm. and see someone at um, Bowling Green because they they have a wealth of information. And I would suggest you do that before you move forward on anything else, just to get a sense of. Um, um, appropriateness or sensitivity in terms of the language if you decide to create some con content or text um, and some description, it would be in your best interest to just make sure that all that is um, appropriate and um, that it's sensitive to the people. Again, I, I the, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna suggest the American, the American Indian Community House they did an exhibition at the Museum of the City of New York. They wrote, you know, land acknowledgments. There was an exhibition called Urban Indian in 2019. So they, I know, I know they've also written um, land acknowledgments for other cultural institutions in New York City. I'm sure they have a lot of requests right now too, mm -hmm. given the political nature of the last two years. But um, I think they're also a good resource. But also very beautiful work. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, yeah I, I would second that. I just wanted to say that the, um, you know, it's beautifully conceived and, you know, like formally, it's very beautiful in the detailing. It seems like you've thought of everything. Um, so not everything. So I want to the committee and <laughs> getting I there, getting, that's why we're all here, right? <laughs>
Um, I'm just also trying to be sensitive on the other side, but certainly the narrative, how it's put forward and uh, appropriate language, it'll all be addressed. I was a Smithsonian fellow a few years ago and I do have correction connections at the Natural History Museum and can reach out to the Indian Museum. I was asking Ken specifically if he knew any kind of uh, representatives from that specific tribe, which makes the connection point easy. That's all, thank you so much. All right, well, if there are no further uh, comments, we uh, thank you very much for this uh, work. And, and I will also say sensitivity to the, um, the folks who work at the EMS station. And uh, so I think you've gotten some very good feedback uh, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you all. I do appreciate it. Thank you, committee. Thank you. Okay, continuing on with the uh, committee meeting. Uh, the next presentation is, uh, this is the title, Resonances, a percent for art installation at the Brownsville Library in Brooklyn. Again, we will not be hearing public testimony, nor will we be voting. So unfortunately, the artist for that project <coughs> isn't quite ready yet. Um, the team has let me know that he should be joining shortly. Um, Kendall, uh, would you like to give an introduction? Uh, good morning. C can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes, hi. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, good to see you all. Um, my name is Kendall Henry. I'm the director of the Percent Fart program. And uh, Christopher Meyer is going to be presenting his project. As, as usual, this project um, for the Brownsville Library was part of the, is part of the Percent Fart program. And Christopher was very instrumental in creating a work that um, really tapped into the community um, with a lot of community engagement. And, and he's gonna present that uh, today. Um, I hope you have a lot of questions. And, uh, and this is, uh, we, we, have, we have gone to the community board um, a couple of times with this one and, and they feel really close to it and, and feel that it really speaks to them. And we're very proud of his approach to this project and we're very proud of what of how the Brownsville community feels about this project and and particularly when they always feel like they don't get anything nice um somebody actually said that at one of the meetings so um hopefully he'll be on very soon I don't have much more to say I, I don't want to you know s spill the surprise <laughs> um so um as as we wait if you have any questions please let me know is there anybody else who could present on his behalf and tell him he's able to join? So I think we need to unmute Kendall again. I, I believe David Lewis from LTL, the architects here. Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot, David, but um, maybe you want to uh, talk a bit about how you've been thinking about the artwork. Oh, oh whoop, sorry. Sorry, I'll he's on the spot later. He, oh, Christopher Myers is here now, so. Can we unmute Chris? Hello, everyone. So sorry. It's all right. We're early. Yeah, we're early. Good morning, Mr. Myers. Please, please begin. Um, I'm going to give you um, control of the screen. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, all good. I can't. I can't hear you guys. But none of, none we'll, of us we'll, are talking. Can you hear me? We'll burn that bridge when we come to it. So. Um, okay, I have control. Great. Just, so sorry, y'all. I was, was scheduled for 10 and I... Oh, here we go. So, hello. My name is Christopher Myers. I'm an artist and a storyteller. Uh, I've done work in a lot of different genres of storytelling, a lot of different ways of thinking about story thinking about history, thinking specifically about both 
underserved communities and African American communities, my, you know, my own people. Um, my family's from Astoria and Harlem. Uh, these are some of my books. I've done books for about 25 years. Um, and in all of the books, the, the point is always about thinking not only about the stories that we tell, but how we tell those stories. So this is a book I did in 2011, thinking about kind of American stories. What is the, what is the difference between immigration in the, you know, the, the, the Mayflower and that kind of generation and more current immigrations? These, these are embroideries turning to my like fine arts work. These are embroideries that I made with when 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 confronted with the idea of what is my relationship to hip hop. Now, I'm a New York kid. I'm African American. Of course, I have a relationship to hip hop. But I, what I really love in in it is the craft. So I, I was building these embroideries based on Lil Wayne lyrics. These are this is a, a cage that I made that related to the freak show on Coney Island. Uh, there were lots of African Americans who performed in these shows, and so I was I was loudly interested in that. Um, this is a series of shadow puppets, traditional shadow puppets created with traditional shadow puppet makers in Indonesia, uh, thinking about the life of Vaslav Nijinsky, who has come up for me in, in numerous ways, but especially as a kind of one of those many folks who sort of lived in the hybrid hy hybridity of many cultures. I think a lot about migration. This is the work that I'm best known for, um, which is kind of quilt work. I'm, I'm always interested in craft. I'm always interested in how do we tell our stories outside of traditional forms. Um, this is one quilt about migration, one quilt about the kind of the, the, the internationalism of current waves of protest, the ways that people borrow uh, forms of protest from each other. This is another kind of storytelling. Um, this, these, this is a piece that I did about the woman Henrietta Lacks, who was an African-American woman whose uh, cells were cultured and cloned and are now the, the foundation of human cellular biology. Uh, these, these stained glass windows are images from the microscope of her cells. And then in the, in the center is a microscope with her actual cells in it. So this is the kinds of things I'm interested in. I'm interested in history. I'm interested in storytelling. I'm interested in how we tell stories. When thinking about this Brownsville library, I think about all the neighborhoods that my family's from in, in New York. When I think about all of the neighborhoods that are sort of considered edgewise in New York. That's one of the interesting things about New York City is that although, you know, all of our, you know, although I come from Lefrak City or Astoria or Harlem, there's always a sense that like there are some neighborhoods that are servicing other neighborhoods and Brownsville has always had that sort of uh, thing to it. Like it's sort of that it was always a working class neighborhood. It was always a neighborhood that was serving other communities. And at the same time, there were there's so much rich cultural blending there, much like you know the life of Nijinsky or kind of all of African American history. It's it's in the cultural blending that that amazing things happen. So what I've proposed is a two part piece that um, lives as a stained glass laylight on top of the of the of the library. And then there's a fence um, separating the youth room from the main part of the library. And I'm interested particularly in this idea of um, in interference patterns. So one of the people, you, know, you talk to the kids who are currently at the Brownsville Public Library and they say, I say, you know, do you, you ever think anyone famous came out of this library? There is a Nobel Prize winner who as a nine year old boy entered the Brownsville Public Library and eventually became responsible for the uh, invention of uh, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. So it's, it's at the center of MRIs. Anytime you've had an MRI, you've dealt with this man, Isidore Isaac Rabi. And these were his diagrams. These were his, his diagrams that I've sort of translated into stained glass. This is a, a study. This is how I work with 
both scientific imagery and some of my own imagery to create these sort of stained glass interpolations of some of the work that starts as a nine year, with a nine year old Jewish kid um, in, in the kind of mass of young Jewish immigrants in Brownsville and, and can end up on the ceiling with all of the folks that have sort of touched Brownsville and have become central to the story of what Brownsville has become and, and, and is today. Um, recently, I was engaged in a theater piece that I, I saw that talked about the difference between gentrification and the, the natural changing of neighborhoods. And I think one of the, the kind of central things is that gentrification erases. It erases past histories and makes the, those of us who are in the, those neighborhoods, there's, the, there's so much work being done to help us forget what has happened in the neighborhood. This is a piece that thinks about how do we not forget? How do we layer over all of the layers that have been Brownsville? When you talk to young people, so I, I went to, I mostly spent a lot of time on the streets talking to young people about Brownsville, but we also did some events at the library. And when you talk to people about what Brownsville is, there is a, there is a short memory, an amazingly short memory that happens so that people can remember someone like uh, Mother Gaston but, or, or Riza, who was born there, but they don't know Zero Mostel or Danny Kay or Howard Zinn and these folks. And I'm interested in making those connections and helping young people to see that there are contemporaries, great contemporaries like Jacqueline Woodson, the author. Um, and then there are, there are Nobel Prize winners like Isidore Isaac Rabi, and that, that they too are part of that continuum. So having done a, a, a ton of research because I, I kind of come from that background, my first jobs was as New York uh, City historical, uh, I was in the New York Public Library as a historical researcher for authors. Um, this is this kind of panoply of folks that I seek to, 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 to undo the erasing that happens, the short memories. So I, I include people like Jacqueline Woodson, who has roots in Brownsville, um, National Book Award winner since, since I made this slide, has won the MacArthur, um, young adult writer, good, good, good person. Ahmed Abdul Malik, who comes from Brownsville, rises in the jazz community, and then does all this work to kind of think about globalization in music, which I think is also central to all of this, this, these neighborhoods in New York. There's ideas that it is in the cultural influences, in the kind of interference patterns, so to speak, that the richness of the neighborhoods come out. Greg Jackson, who's a pro athlete who came back to the neighborhood and there's now a community center there uh, named after him. Howard Zinn, the historian that we, we all know, um, uh, People's History of the United States. There's a picture of him with Baldwin. Um, Zero Mustel, who I feel like we should know, uh, if, if only for his testimony on the House on American Activities Committee, which I think is brilliant, um, but also, you know, Fiddler on the Roof, originating that role and, and all so many things like that. Mother Rosetta Gaston, who was one of the kind of vernacular historians that in the late 60s, early, early in late 60s, sort of brought to the fore the kind of need for telling Black history and telling, this is a picture of her with Carter G. Woodson, one of the, someone known as like the father of Black history. Max Fleischer, one of the early animators. Um, and again, to think about this idea of what cultural influence does, what the interference pattern does, the still there, and I haven't said this in any of my rehearsals for this, the still there is from uh, a collaboration he did with Cab Calloway. And that kind of collaboration the, with the clown, the, the clown's movements are based on Cab Calloway, the voice is Cab Calloway. And this is the kind of cultural mixing that makes a neighborhood great. This is part of what makes New York great. This is Israel Isaac Rabi, Nobel Prize winner. Um, and this is a quote from him. He says, I'm, on, I'm an omnivorous reader, looking back at his discovery of the local branch of the Brooklyn Public Library after moving to the Brownsville section. And that local branch was this branch. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to kind of make these full circle connections to not have a young person look at, 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 at their library, at their world, as, and somehow be, think of it as isolated. Here's Donald Kagan, one of the premier scholars of the Peloponnesian War. Um, 
this is Zerana Horton. Now, this was a name that was given to me by a lot of the young people in the neighborhood because she was a young mother who shielded several children with her body and, and saved them from a shooting. And I, I think that it's important to kind of parallel all of these kinds of heroism, all of these kinds of, of I don't know, of, of, of thinking toward the future. Here is a photo of the library from the time that Isidore Isaac Rabi was uh, studying there as, as, a, as a nine-year-old boy. Um, and in my original plan, I had thought about doing a big round light, but then seeing this photo, I saw that there was originally, um, uh, you know, underneath the layers of, of kind of drop ceiling and particle board that now lives in the library, there was originally this, this light. And so I thought it would be best to kind of follow that pattern. So you can see where the the lights stand, where the where the res where the railing will stand. Um, this is more. This is what it looks like currently. So as you see, all of the earlier kind of uh, framework for the ley light isn't there. Um, and then this is what what we imagine it as in 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 this kind of current iteration. And so there's this ley light. That, that includes all these, these, these figures. And then there is, that, that will be cited there. This is a, a kind of a, a map of some of the people. And I also hope that as it is in a library, it becomes the site of um, a, a way for, for people to, to kind of imagine the, the, to do research, to, to be like kind of a site of research. Um, and then this is this railing. So the railing also uses, this is where the railing will be in the current iteration of the library. The railing also uses nuclear magnetic resonance spectra. This is what, what, what that looks like. This is an actual kind of image on the upper left, which I've then built as a kind of a steel railing that I will include portraits and sort of inclusions of folks that are important. So this is a Zorana Horton piece. This is this uh, paralleling of two kinds of, of warriors, this Peloponnesian warrior and uh, Zermana Horton. So this, and this is where the railing will stand in relationship to a kind of a glass uh, safety, a safety glass. So, and another kind of reverse view of the railing. Maintenance, this is, you know, th these are old, old materials. I, I, I love old materials. I love quilts. I love all of these kind of things. This is stained glass and stained glass, they will, primarily will need dusting, um, comparable kind of glass cleaner, that sort of thing. Um, and this is where, where we end. This is what the vision is. And I'm, I'm super excited for and open to questions um, and, if, and, and, and anything else. Let me just make sure that my sound is on so that I can hear anyone speaking. Oh, there we go. I hear everything. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Myers. That was a really uh, evocative piece. I, I greatly appreciate the thought and uh, research that you've put into this and, uh, and, the, and the spectrum, as you said, of, of ages and history and personalities uh, all, all wrapped together. Um, I had one question. Absolutely. Where are the stories that you showed um, about the individuals who are represented in both the stained glass and railing? We're, we're hoping in the uh, crediting uh, area, the part where, where, where the, the, to, to give a key to the names. And then we're, we're also hoping that it becomes a sort of jumping off point for research for young folks. I mean, we are in a library. That's sort of what our goal is. Um, and yeah, that's, that's absolutely it. Great. Um, other commissioners uh, would care to say something? My question was the same as yours, Signe. I was just wondering um, how young people in the library today will make the connection and understand um, who is represented and why. And I just want to say, uh, Mr. Myers, that you're claiming the histories for the young people there now and making that, that connection um, across different 
immigrant groups across different people. Um, you know, as a young person growing up and going to the library a lot myself, I think there is a sense of displacement, like what's your connection to history? And it's, it's very hard for young people to understand that. And um, the kind of old materials with this idea of uh, um, connections across histories is to me very poetic and beautiful. And, and I just wanna um, commend the, the um, what is kind of a radical, extending of the hand in an old uh, material is to me um, poetically beautiful and, and right. Thank you so much. And that's absolutely what, what my, my goal is with this. It's, it's this idea that, you know, as a kid growing up in New York myself, there's this way in which you like identify with various things that people didn't expect you to identify with. And, 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 and I'm always excited for, for, to make those kind of connections for young people. Yeah, your piece tells young people it's okay to claim that history for themselves. Hey, Christopher. Um, I agree. Hey, Hi, how are you? Good, good. Um, I'm excited about your projects. I actually think um, I am always enamored by artists who do so much research about space and also um, technique and arrangement. Uh, so I, your, I think your piece is really well organized and presented and I'm excited to see it. Um, I think I agree with Deborah. I, it is important to have uh, a visual presence. Um, I have three sons and them walking into a library, they want, they want to, I do my job of letting them know their um, African-American and indigenous history and Ecuadorian history, but there's where they live, actually, there's no literal connection to mm -hmm. R. So I have that, that is a, a different job that, you know, I have to make a connection between them also being from Queens, et cetera. Um, so I, I really appreciate and, and admire that, um, uh, you know, the need to want to do that research and have that thoughtfulness in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would, I would say, um, perhaps in our conversation with the architect and um, whether there are other places to also present the project, how that the, the text would also connect to the work. Is there a, a different type of, um, you know, maybe a plaque that would introduce the list of the names that they should, that should be researched. I think that, that uh, the way that that's presented could also be directly connected visually um, to the to the actual artwork, um, and I think that because this project feels so big, um, I don't know if uh, Percent for Heart or um, would have a larger budget to create pr probably more places for um, other murals similar to this to be presented in the space. I'm not sure what the limitations are, but I think that because the project is such a um, large project and there's so many people that could be um, made works of. Uh, that's a conversation that I think would would be interesting and appropriate for this project, considering, um, you know, uh, the nature of it and that how much how much this information would enrich the community and the children in the community. Thanks. I, I I'm I'm most excited as my you know I'm, because I do have I have worked with kids for so long. I'm most excited to kind of see how they interact with it and, and to kind of see that that idea of, of a jumping off point, you know, and, and to see where that can go. Yeah. What up, Chris? What up, Ken Seth? How you doing, brother? <laughs> I just uh, wanted to give you that very professional hailing uh, because I admire your work. I've known it for so long. I'm just so uh, I'm just so thrilled about this piece. Oh, and uh, you, it's very difficult to make a piece that is at one point cosmological and uh, that has universal appeal, but then also is quite personal, quite local. You put in the work. So there's layer and there's history and there's all of those things that, you know, I consider to be, you know, part of an elegant, you know, public design. Uh, and I just, uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Cause uh, you know, I, of course I appreciate you as part of the community of artists that I think are making great work, but this one, I, I think you've knocked out of the park. I, I would only say that if, if it were up to me, there would be those, um, you know, magnetic resonating, resonance images that are in the railing would also be extended to the chairs and tabletops and sort of you just have this magnetic resonance 
of all of these characters so that their stories could be embedded in the chairs and on the tables. And, and then you have these focal pieces that are there. Of course, we don't live in a perfect society with the unlimited budgets and time, but I just think it's really quite a beautiful thing. And, and, uh, and I'm really proud of what you put to, out here. Oh, thanks so much. And I'm going to think about make, maybe I'll donate a table. I'll, I can figure out a way to make a table. That, 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 that will... just, one, just one table. Right. That's one table. One proper <laughs> library I'm, table. I'm everyone. Hi, this is Lori. I just, everyone Hello. will be fighting over that table, Christopher. But um, I can understand why um, Kendall, the introduction that was given um, and the community support for the project, obviously, that was, um, I can Amen. see that it, it resonates there and, and will resonate. So I'm I'm also incredibly excited about the piece and would, you know, second and third, what Mary and, and Kenseth um, and Deborah have said. Um, and I really think that didactic part, you know, which is really the kind of, kind of second, it's like the twin to the project, right? right. So um, like how that can be like, just not some sign, which I know it won't be, um, but, you know, given your work, but um, I think that's super important too, so that people can really, um, so that not everybody will be standing in one spot looking at this, but they'll be able to be other places throughout the space, um, you know, getting to get a little deeper into the project. So thank you. Thank you. And, and I agree with that. I think it's an amazing piece. Uh, I think you're a tremendously talented artist and thank you. fortunate actually to own one of your works. So I probably shouldn't even be talking. Um, but I will. Um, but I had one plug that follows up with everyone else's comments about building on the amazing uh, research you've done. And not to state the obvious, but we are in a library. And the library probably has an obligation to both uh, provide and make available in the context of your work, all the many, many books, whether written by the people you figured or works about them, books about them, um, and we might, you know, to follow on Kent's idea of having one more extraordinary piece, maybe it should be just be a table that has those books um, of the people who are in fact depicted on both the railing uh, and on the stained glass. And it's such a powerful piece and such an important message that I think we should uh, not stop until we've really hammered it home. <laughs> right. So, uh, thank you for that. It's great. Thank you, and I'm excited. Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> I hope that gives you some uh, strength and courage to go on. Uh, it's obviously uh, uh, both loved by the community and, and by the commission. I congratulate you uh, for that, and we look forward to seeing it uh, in its uh, almost final iteration. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. The Thank whole you. Team. See y'all. Peace Bye. out. Bye bye. Thank you. All right. Um, so now moving on, uh, we will uh, begin the public meeting with a vote on the consent agenda. Uh, we are voting today on items uh, number 27766 to 27801. Um, please note Commissioner Martin's recusal on item 27789. Are there any other recusals to note? Okay, uh, uh, let the record show there are no further recusals. So I'll now call uh, for a vote. Commissioners, when I call your name, please state your vote for the consent agenda. You may approve or reject all. You may also reject or abstain from any um, individual project. Uh, Phil. Approve all. Ken Seth. Approve all. Lori. Approve all. Deborah. Approve all with an abstention related to the aforementioned recused item. Yes, indeed. Uh, Karen. So is this a vote on just the agenda or a vote on something that has been discussed previously? These are all items that have been, well, Carrie, you can say it more articulately. Oh, maybe. So this is a group vote on the items that are listed on the consent agenda. They have all, they all have recommendations for approval. Okay, so approval. Thank you. Uh, Manuel? Approval. Susan? Approval. Ethel, are you with us? 
Guess not quite yet. Not yet. Okay, Meryl? Approval. Mary? Approval. And myself, approval. So even without Ethel, we have uh, uh, certainly uh, enough votes and they are all um, approve all. So the consent agenda is um, adopted. So now we're going to move on to the public hearing with item number 27802, Urban Poet. This is also a percent for art installation at the Atlantic Avenue median in Brooklyn. So per standard procedure, the applicants will give their presentation, then public testimony will be heard, and then uh, the commission will ask questions, deliberate, and we will vote today. And if, if anyone is watching YouTube right now or watching this video on YouTube and you would like to testify on this project, please sign up and join the Zoom meeting now. And there are directions for signing up and joining the meeting in the description below the video. Okay, we can start the presentation. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. Well, my name is Alexandra Rechea. I was born in Cuba, uh, born and raised. In the late 90s, I started a journey as an international artist, uh, being invited to uh, many events around the world, mainly in New York. Um, um, my work in, in this sense is, the, is, uh, is an ongoing investigation on architecture. And the work that I'm going to uh, introduce is part of the extension of, of that investigation. Um, meaning that, uh, for instance, for me, it's, it's important to understand that these, uh, there are like uh, subjective structures, I call like that. Uh, when uh, uh, my work refers to cultural, political, or economical uh, uh, instances. So uh, to start with the work, uh, Urban uh, uh, Poet, which is going to be located at Atlantic Avenue, in Brooklyn, uh, the, show, the, the work uh, basically shows uh, a tilted um, unicycle. The tilted unicycle uh, has a wheel uh, with motifs that uh, makes reference to a specific building in the surroundings uh, of, the, of the area. Uh, this um, uh, mainly focus on the windows of this particular building which is a, a public school. And my intention with this uh, dialogue that I'm going to establish is uh, for me have been relevant the idea that many of the uh, public school doesn't have a, 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 an art program. And for me, uh, this idea was so interesting that when I was invited to create a proposal for, for the median in Brooklyn, I realized that I can connect these, uh, these uh, elements uh, and uh, bring uh, the object to become a bridge uh, uh, for that gap, let's say. So um, meaning that besides the fact that, uh, that the piece is gonna be standing at this public site, it also for me will be relevant to bring uh, some sort of discussions to the public uh, program, I mean, to the program of the public school, and this is a personal thing that I'm planning uh, on my own, uh, to establish this dialogue so that the uh, school uh, see themselves set at this prominent uh, uh, avenue, and at the same time, it gives me the entrance for me to uh, give a broader, a broader uh, uh, idea of what my work is about. Definitely there are, um, and solutions that I, um, I have taken uh, to create this uh, uh, object. And one of them is uh, are regarding color. I don't know if I'm able to actually run through the images, but um, I gave you one control. of the things- I gave you control so I can, but I can help scroll for you if that's easier. Okay, please scroll. Okay. Um, so if you can keep it scrolling down, yeah, that will be the side for the, for the uh, actual piece, it is, um, yeah, and the intersection with conduit. And um, one of the things that are, is relevant for me as well is the treatment of, um, uh, I mean, the materials, obviously I'm using um, a mild steel, aluminum, and, um, and then uh, the painting that I'm gonna be using for this particular piece, uh, specifically the wheel 
uh, is in a, a deep orange uh, called Orange uh, International, which is uh, a color by Tenemec, which for me is important because this particular color also made a, allusion to the, or mimic a little bit the idea of the bricks of the facade for this particular public school. So you can see here the color, how it's, it's treated. But at the same time, it has that uh, a character of being a, an urban, a, a, well, I call it urban in the sense that I take it from these uh, basketball hoops. And I have done this, this used this color in previous uh, uh, projects. But in this particular case, for me, this appeal of with the orange is something that actually works in the sense of the uh, having a, the the idea of basketball as a, an appeal for the for the urban uh, look. And um, also, uh, I have to say that a um, urban poet, besides uh, being uh, this particular presentation here. It also is part of this evolution of my work that started uh, back in 2013 when I presented uh, for the first time in New York a, a project titled No Limits, which involved uh, several uh, structures or public uh, um, or buildings from, from the city of New York as part of, of, my, um, of my idea of how the city uh, is in constant transformation and evolution. Uh, meaning that the fact that the that the unicycle is tilted and is sort of like um, out of balance uh, uh, is calling for the attention to grab control of the situation and make the city uh, to run somehow. That for me is uh, what is relevant about this particular uh, piece. Um, other um, elements are, are related to the, the, the structure. I don't know, uh, the, the, for instance, the fork, it will be yellow, mimicking obviously a regular, um, um, a regular uh, unicycle. The saddle obviously will also be black and, and, and yellow, also resembling the, the regular unicycle and the pedals also will uh, uh, mimic the, the actual pedals of one unicycle. Um, I don't know if I have to uh, bring some other issues here, uh, but basically that's, that's the, the idea behind uh, Urban Poet. Thank you very much. Um, would any commissioners care to, we've been offered a, three options with a preferred option being shown here uh, by the artist. Does um, anyone care to comment on this? Um, Signe, I think we do have Oh, someone. excuse me. No, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to ask. Sorry. I believe we have one person, Todd Fine, sign, is he? Sorry, my glasses. Okay, I see. Uh, okay, Todd, you have three minutes. Go ahead. Yes. Um, Hi, good morning. I'm Todd Fine. I'm the president of the Washington Street Advocacy Group, which advocates on public art and reform of uh, the, the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, between uh, 2015 and 2017, um, after a controversy about a DOT Percent for Art project in Long Island City by Ohad Moroni, Moroni uh, the city council passed reform legislation requiring a community outreach for local artist participation in new significant public art projects. At the time, hundreds of community members went to a public forum and stated they were distraught that they had only heard about this uh, that uh, project, the, the Pink Sunbather, uh, long after the issue had been decided. Uh, many stated that they would have preferred to uh, involve a local artist in that project and themes that were more relevant to, the, uh, to that particular neighborhood. Now, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm the only person of the public who's testifying here tomorrow. And maybe DCLA did meet the, both the text and the spirit of the reform legislation, but I have significant concerns and I think DCLA should explain them today. Um, there is absolutely no online record at all of any public outreach, of any public meetings in Cypress Hill, Brooklyn. We have no uh, representation from anybody in Cypress Hills today. There's no video online. There's not even a single 
press article about a, a, a giant unicycle, you know, sculpture that's going to be percent planned for Cypress Hills. To me, this 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 seems like it could generate a future controversy. Now, I, I'm not I don't want to say too much about the artwork. I don't have a particular critique about it. But I do think that the, I mean, the artists claim that the instability of the unicycle he sees as a metaphor for the instability of politics in the city. And that that's actually quite a quite an incisive political critique that that is being put in a community that might have different uh, political ideas about how that should be presented. So what I would like to ask is that before the, uh, the be considered, uh, DCLA explain all of the public process that occurred to ensure that they did do an, a local artist outreach, uh, that there is substantial community support support, and maybe they could explain why no public meetings and no press coverage and no press release and no announcements and nothing at all on the percent for art or DCLA website mentions this proposal. Maybe the, the dating is wrong. I could be totally wrong that this is like a 10 year old project and maybe that's the reason, but uh, I have s serious questions about it. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Mr. Fine. Uh, and Sini, do you want to say, uh, just I can't speak for the percent for art program, but it does include uh, members from the community uh, that the panel process does and uh, all projects do go to the community board for review. Um, yes, this this project. Um, okay, yeah, Kendall. Hi, could talk oh, good morning. Let me put my video on. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, Cultural Affairs could talk more about the Percent for Arts selection process and how they um, outreach to the community through that multi-phase process. But uh, during the, um, the actual design of the artwork, we go to the community board. And I don't have the, the date right in front of me, but we went to the community board January 2019, I think, to the Transportation Committee. And um, several members uh, participated, including some local artists. And I'm just gonna add to that as well. Um, yeah, for every project that we do, we do do local outreach to, to the to artists that are there and, um, and, and some are presented. And uh, as Xenia and, and, and Carrie mentioned that, again, before we even come to a PDC, we do meet with the community board at, um, when it's convenient for them and, and the community that they feel is most appropriate to present the work to. And, uh, and yeah, so that, that's very standard for all our projects. Thank you, uh, Kendall. And um, is there, uh, do commissioners want to uh, opine on the color alternatives? Um, yes, I have a question in terms of the I guess the intensity of the, the orange and yellow. Um, I understand the why these were picked, but I was wondering if there was any flexibility in terms of the palette arrangement, um, if, it, if the orange or could be a little more subdued or whether that, that orange specifically was, um, you feel as an artist is a like a, conceptual marker for your work um, and whether you've studied, I guess, the lighting and a response to um, the landscape and the architecture behind or in front of the artwork, how, how does it look in relationship to that? Um, and if that was the case, if this artwork had this color, um, did, have you done any studies in relationship to, you know, the landscape surrounding the artwork and how that how that looks or appears. Sure, yes. Uh, well, you know, um, well, like you say, it's, it's sort of a trade uh, mark. Uh, these colors that I use, uh, the yellow and the orange, mm -hmm. I repeatedly has, has used these colors in several uh, projects. Um, the orange, as you might see it there, it, it sounds like too bright or maybe too shiny, but in the end, it's not like that. I mean, the, the, the image is, probably doesn't translate actually the, the actual, uh, we are talking about a flat color. 
-hmm. doesn't shine. It is, I mean, both ye uh, yellow and orange. And at the same time, um, the, um, the, um, the international orange used by, by Tenemic, it has a quality also that a, it can be restored easily in the sense that let's say 10 years after it's being installed, whatever scratch that I might have in the future, you don't, you don't have to repaint the whole thing, but you just apply to certain uh, scratches that you might have. So it has the practical element, but at the same time, it has the, the let's say the, the, the brand of my work, which is uh, uh, this uh, particular yellow and orange. But at the same time, like I was telling initially, uh, the idea of mimicking the bricks of the, of the, of the facade of the building it, it will allow me also to, obviously, I, I, I set out here like three different tonalities for that orange. The final tonality of that one is, is you have to see it on the actual metal. Uh, but it's, but uh, I, uh, for me, from my experience, uh, it totally connect uh, with the surroundings with no problem. I, I have exhibit, for instance, uh, on Park Avenue, and I didn't use the, the orange, I did the red, and it, 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 it flows perfectly. And, uh, and also the yellow, I have used it in uh, at Coachella Festival uh, in the past, of, uh, and, and it also, it is relevant because it's obviously yellow, but it's not uh, something that is going to like disturb you or like even the traffic or anything like that. You know, it is some, something it is, it is more subtle in the sense that it's, it's flat. Okay. <clears throat> well, I uh, like the red better than the orange, but I'm not sure if um, uh, what Kenseth would consider or um, if you have an opinion about it. But, um, well, actually, there are no reds. There are like different tonalities of orange. The first one, right. it the might seem one. red, but it's actually orange. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. The the one all the way on the left. Oh, okay, okay. I, that's all. I would uh, I support you on that, Mary. That I think the darker the darker international orange works better for me. Um, and then the only other thing that I would have as a question is that I'm sure that the the many uh, people uh, like uh, in the in the figure you see there's a figure that's near the pedal, and so every part of that articulated pedal part will be uh, static. They won't move at all. Yeah, they won't move. Okay, so just to, just to check. Um, and uh, yeah, I, th I think, I, I, I mean, if it's down to that, uh, the, the, the darker red would work better for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then- right, there uh, also, oh, sorry. And then what, well, then as far as uh, the, the gentleman who made comment about what it politically means, I think it's quite open-ended what it politically means. And that active space is a question. Uh, and I think democracy is built on questioning. So that's all I wanted to say. Well put, Kenseth. Um, so just to be sure I understand, um, Mary and Kenseth, you were both um, agreeing with the artist's uh, proposal for color study three. Is that, did I understand that correctly? No. Color study one. Color color study study, one. We both agreed on color study one, yes. Okay, all right. Um, does, uh, we, are, are going to, we are going to vote on this project uh, and we're also going to uh, express our opinion uh, on the preference of color. So um, does any, uh, do any other commissioners care to make a statement one way or another about color? Yeah, I, I agree with um, the color choice, uh, colors, you know, the darker red, but in the color study three where, you know, the, uh, the window sills are also painted, you know, the entire color instead of white, I prefer it all to be the same color. I think it's just a better hierarchy. I uh, agree. Yeah. yeah. I, I, like, I, like the I surreal, agree. I agree with that as well. This is Lori. I agree with that. Well, that detail that that uh, Manuel is bringing up, um, because there is a difference between those two. I agree with the whole thing being the color of one, but completely colored as in three. It just seems more like kind of you know, it's not a caricature of a building. It's just kind of the whole thing is painted. Yes. 
and it's an imprint. No, but uh, all right. Um, anyone else care to make a statement? Otherwise, <clears throat> I think that the proposal that we are voting on uh, is to approve the artwork with the Maybe choice. Excuse me. Oh, um, with the, um, the the choice of color study one color, but in a full painting as in color study three. It's a little confusing. We'll just, if anyone doesn't understand what I just said, ask. Um, so I'm going to make a roll call here uh, for approval with that uh, motion. Actually, I need to ask for a second on that motion. Second. Thank you. Um, wow, I <laughs> Zoom has altered my brain cells. Um, Phil. Uh, I approve with uh, color selection one. Uh, Ken Seth. I approve with uh, color selection one and the full treatment as solid. Thank you, Lori. Lori. Approve with color selection one and the full color treatment is in three. Thank you. Um, Deborah. Approve as described by the other commissioners. Thank you. Karen. Approved with color selection one. Thank you. Uh, Manuel. Approved with color section one, full color facade. Susan. Color section one and color treatment as in three. Thank you. Uh, Ethel? It's gonna be hard if she's in a car. Um, Meryl? Approved. Thank you. Mary? Approved um, with choice number one, color selection with a full uh, color treatment as a number three. Thank you. Uh, and myself, I uh, concur with my fellow commissioners. So we have uh, unanimous approval for the project uh, and we have unanimous consensus on uh, both color and uh, completeness of color. Does anyone, um, any one of the presenters or agencies have a question? Okay, um, so thank you. Um, so now we are going to move on uh, to the next uh, public hearing of item number 27803, the reconstruction of the Passerelle Bridge and Plaza in Flushing Meadows, Corona Park in Queens. So this time I'll try to follow my own rules here. Um, per standard procedure, the applicants will give their presentation, then uh, public testimony will be heard and then uh, the commissioners can ask questions, uh, deliberate, and we will vote. So and who do we have presenting here today? So Mira from Parks will give an introduction and then Michal from STP will present. So Michal, I've given you control. Oh yeah, there you go. Great. And I just wanna note that if anyone is watching on YouTube right now and you would like to give testimony on this project, please sign up and then join the Zoom meeting now. And there are instructions for doing this in the description below the video. Okay, go ahead. Hey, thanks, good morning. Uh, my name is Mira Burkauer. I'm the Director of Planning and Project Management for Queens Parks. Um, and as Grace mentioned, I'll be giving a quick introduction and background before we begin our presentation. So prior to the air train, um, the proposed air train, the city allocated $124 million for an in-kind replacement of the Passerell Bridge. Once the city began design, we learned about the proposed air train. We started to coordinate with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which we soon learned um, that the proposed air train was planned to connect the Long Island Railroad Willits Point Station. For a visit, for efficiency, it made sense for Port Authority with the city funding to design and build the Passerelle Bridge as part of the overall air, air train project with parks and city DOT oversight and approval. We have been coordinating with the New York State Historic Preservation Office, SHPO. And the presentation you're seeing uh, this morning is a result of the coordination between SHPO, MTA, New York City DOT. 
since we've been working closely with New York City DOT, uh, we have Nick Pedinati is joining us today. And um, I'd like to introduce Michal Rovitz from STV, who will be giving the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayra. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Mayra mentioned, the Passerelle Bridge is uh, reaching its useful life and needs to be replaced. And this is part of the, uh, and this is the main goal of this project. Uh, the project scope includes reconstruction of the pastoral bridge in kind, uh, maintaining and restore historic words for elements and provide full ADA accessibility to the bridge. Sorry, I'm jumping. Uh, the project is located just north of the uh, Flushing Meadow Corona Park over the uh, New York City Transit 7 line uh, train yard. And that's where it's point stations. Sorry, this is very sensitive. Uh, this slide shows the, uh, the existing passerelle in relationship to the, uh, the proposed Air train alignment, which is shown in uh, magenta color. Uh, as mentioned, the Passerelle Bridge is located between the Meridian Road and Roosevelt Avenue, just north of Flushing Meadows Corner Park. This slide shows the existing Passerelle geometry. So going from the north side, which is on the left side, left hand side of the screen, the Passerelle, uh, the pedestrians can hit connect to the Passerelle Bridge uh, by means of one long uh, ramp from Roosevelt Avenue street level up to the Passerelle deck level. There is three additional ramps going up to the uh, New York City Transit uh, seven line stations. Station, two ramps, east and west ramp going up to uh, the platform level and one ramp going down to the mezzanine level. At the south side, there's one ramp connecting to David Banking Circle and the park. This slide shows, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this slide shows the, uh, the, north, uh, the north side of the, the north end of the pastoral. And um, the main, the, main um, uh, the reason we included those photos is that uh, the bridge uh, today serves as a main uh, connector to various venues. And you can, uh, and the experience that you have uh, as walking down the, the, the bridge is what you can call uh, a processional experience, which is basically made by a series of flat poles and light poles and the bridge itself. This is uh, this slide shows the south end of the passerelle, the zigzag canopy that is being removed as part of this project, restored and placed back exactly to the same uh, location. This slide shows the south end the David Dinkins Circle on the left hand side and the Meridian Road. And we're looking up at the existing 1964 uh, main gate uh, canopy. And here's proposed uh, pastoral geometry uh, and alignment. So the bridge is being moved by 40 feet to the west, to the east side. We're reconstructing the same number of ramps, one ramp going up from the Roosevelt Avenue to the pastoral deck level two ramps going up to the platform level, the seven line uh, station, and one ramp going down to the mezzanine level. On the south side, we're making the existing ramp ADA compliant. And also as part of our coordination with SHPO, we identified the historic elements that create this pastoral, this historic or uh, this pastoral identity and experience as you're walking down the pastoral. And those elements include uh, flag poles, light poles, paving pattern, and also the railway, which is very uh, specific. This is a quick overview of the north end uh, geometry, one ramp going up to the main deck from the Roosevelt Avenue, two ramps up to the mezzanine level, and one ramp, uh, I'm sorry, to the uh, uh, to the platform level, one ramp going down to the uh, mezzanine level. The dots represent light poles, black poles um, that are being placed on the, on the newly constructed passerelle. Well. This is the mid segment of the passerelle. The layout uh, that we're proposing matches the historic layout 
uh, of the fog poles. The light poles, uh, the light poles are being more dense to provide MBDOT uh, lighting criteria for pedestrian bridges. We also proposing the paving pattern that is a reminiscent of the existing paving pattern as it was designed for 1964 Wards This is the South End Plaza in relationship to the future air train uh, podium uh, that is shown here in gray. The plaza will receive uh, concrete scoring that matches the historic scoring. And here's the building, the pastoral building that is being restored. Uh, the paving is being, uh, the paving, the new paving will match the historic uh, scoring and joints pattern. And again, the, uh, the ramp going down to Baby Bank in Stockholm will be made uh, ADA accessible because the existing ramp is parabolic shape, has no landings, and it's not accessible per ADA standards. Uh, this slide shows the, um, um, the benches that we're proposing for the pastoral project. These are actually 1964 words for benches uh, that we can right now today see around the park and, and, and also on the pastoral, roof, uh, pastoral building roof terraces. And here's the slide that shows the proposed layout, uh, a template of the scoring pattern. Uh, it looks, uh, although it looks uh, kind of irregular, it's a repetitive pattern that, will, that is made out of a 40, approximately 40 by 40 square. And it's repetitive along the alignment of the bridge. And on the right-hand side, you see the proposed concrete scoring and brushed uh, finish. And here's another slide that shows the railing, the types, the different types of railing and different heights of railing that we are proposing for the pastoral bridge. The orange shows the 54 inch high uh, railing. Uh, the blue areas are located over the LIR or MTA tracks and need to be higher. So this, this, these areas will receive eight feet high uh, chain link. And also the, on the right-hand side, the, the magenta, uh, Holler represents the historic uh, railing with the uh, expanded metal panels infills that is that will be removed, restored, and placed back and raised by uh, to match the today's um, uh, to match the code standard height for the railing. Here's the proposed uh, design uh, for the most part of the of the uh, of the pastoral railing. Uh, the railing is being raised to 54 inch high, and it's also the design is integrated with the light poles and flat poles that now will be placed on the center line of the railing. As you can see here, it's an integrated design. This slide shows uh, the proposed eight feet high chain link over the tracks. Here's another uh, section of how we're planning on mounting this, uh, this chain link. We are plan uh, we're planning on mounting it to the base of the bridge. And here's the lighting, the proposed lighting. So the lighting will be 14 inch high pedestrian scale, um, uh, David pole, a standard New York City DOT, 14 feet high David pole with the LED uh, stat luminar. This, uh, this design move is a reminiscent of the original uh, curved top uh, 1964 Ward Square uh, light poles. And here are the proposed flag poles. The flag poles will match the height of the existing flag poles. And also, as I mentioned before, the layout would match the existing historic layout of the flag poles. So the number will be the same. And again, the, light, the flag poles are integrated with the railing. And there is a series of uh, renderings that I'll go through right now. So this is the aerial view of the pastoral going from the right-hand side, the north, three, four ramps on the north side. This is the pedestrian bridge, the plaza, and the, and the, um, the pastoral building, uh, roof terraces, and the thinking circle on the left. Here's an aerial view looking northwest, showing the, the, the restored uh, pastoral building, the plaza, restored canopy, sorry, canopy, and the bridge itself, ending with the four ramps at the north side. 
another shop looking west. Uh, this shop, uh, this rendering looks at the north end of the bus route. This is the, the ramp connecting to Roosevelt Avenue. These are the ramps connecting to a seven line station. And here's the, the rendering showing the Roosevelt Avenue uh, connection. So this is how the pedestrian will connect from the street level up. They will make, they will go south, then east, and then again south to connect to the bus route. Here's the same ramp connecting to the street level, just looking north the other direction. Same ramp, uh, just another shot showing the integration of the light poles and the rally and the proposed rally. And this is the shot of, uh, of the north end showing proposed paving, scoring pattern, um, the light poles, the flat poles. Some of the light poles will be, to meet the DOT criteria, they will be double armed, but most of the lighting will be integrated with the rally. Here's another shot of the north end showing the proposed paving pattern that is a reminiscent of, again, 1964, um, scoring to recreate that uh, original experience of walking down the pass rail. Here's an aerial view looking south, shows the north end, the 40 foot wide bridge segment and 14 feet high uh, David Paul lighting. And this is the same um, uh, direction, the same view, just uh, from the pedestrian uh, perspective, as you can see the, uh, the proposed paving. Another, um, view, just a night shot of the same angle, the same location. And as we go and we, and we approach the south end of the pastoral, this is the bridge. Uh, you, can, you can see the, the zigzag canopy. You can also see the, um, this is a night shot of the same view. You can also see the proposed eight foot high chain link that we have to place on the pastoral over the tracks, the LIR tracks. Another shot of the south end, uh, pastoral building with the restored um, paving, uh, benches, and uh, the building and the wall that is also being re uh, restored as part of the project. And another shot of the south end, baby thinking circle on the right hand side. As we change the, uh, the geometry of the ramp, of the ADA ramp, we are planning to recreate the same uh, pattern, paving pattern uh, as it exists right now, uh, going down to the David Dinkin circle. And here's the shot of, of the pastoral roof of the east roof terrace. It also shows the proposed uh, topping uh, concrete scoring to match existing historic scoring. And now we'll go through a couple of slides of uh, building restoration. So the building will be uh, uh, restored to the state of good repair. As you can see right now, the building has a lot of uh, missing paint cracks and uh, the entire building envelope will be restored. The brick envelope will, rest will be restored. The railing with the uh, expanded metal infills will be restored and placed back. Uh, this is interesting uh, slide that shows at the very bottom, it shows uh, the original historic photos from 1964 as the building was open. So we are, uh, as, as the pastoral was open and the words for was open. So we are, as part of this project, we are restoring the look and feel of, of that 1964 uh, appearance of the building. And the, the photos on the top show the deterioration of the building, cracks, missing paint. The building was repainted multiple times over the years. And there is a couple uh, elevations or technical uh, views of the pastoral building that uh, represents that uh, restoration uh, to, of good repair of the building. And I believe this is the last slide. All right, thank you very much. That is a, um, an extraordinary uh, three-dimensional circulation system. I, uh, I applaud you for weaving this all together. Um, 
Uh, and thank you for uh, uh, responding to some of the concerns that have been raised along the way. First off, are there, um, is there any public testimony? No, no one has signed up. All right, thank you. Um, would any commissioners care to uh, comment, ask questions? Um, I have uh, a couple of comments or just questions actually. Um, it, it would, have you guys considered um, the, way, the wayfinding system and how that would be integrated with the subway and also people, um, the Flushing Meadow Park system and how that's going to either remain similar or be in the similar code for that? Because I know it's, this feels like a terminal, you know? So it's so um, abundant with directions and intersections that I would, I, I think that um, that's really important to consider in terms of the whole project being integrated with what's already there in terms of subway connections and parking and Flushing Meadow Park, City Field and all of that. Um, and uh, I, want, I wonder if you've also considered um, the locations of possible vendors, where that would, if there is a specific location that is going to be given for them because they're going to come um, in that space or they're going to close to that space. And if there's any sort of, con um, consideration for those, for those spaces. Um, uh, also the flags in some of the places seem to disappear. And I'm not sure if you guys are considering um, making sure that the original flags are consistent. If you're using New York City and American flags only, is there uh, a possibility of, um, you know, introducing international flags since Queens is so such an international borough I don't know what the pro like the proposals would be for that, but I would think it would kind of be interesting. A lot of CUNY schools have all international flags in their lobbies. I think that would be a, a really um, beautiful way to sort of pay, pay tribute to the international um, uh, population in the borough. Um, and I also, because it's so such a huge project, I would I wanted to know if there was a percent for art, percent for art. Um, investment in the space because it's so, I, I feel like there needs to be art in not, in not just one, but several different places, even if it's not a permanent piece, maybe something that could circulate or um, participate with either the MTA or percent for art or something in that within the project proposal. Um, that's, those are the things I would like for you to consider or maybe perhaps um, have some response to. Um, sure. Oh, sorry. Um, can I answer that? Or? Yeah, oh, go yes, ahead. Please. Go. Yes, please. Okay. Um, so thank you. Yes. Um, so I wrote down all the points. Um, so first, I'll, I'll address most of them. Um, in terms of wayfinding, yes, we know that's very important for this area um, and important in general for Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Um, this is the main gateway to Flushing Meadows Corona Park, um, and it's it's really important in this location. Um, so we are um, uh, we're going to be working with um, MTA Port Authority um, in order to uh, integrate the wayfinding. Um, we just haven't gotten um, it's something that we're we're going to work with them on. Um, uh, then in terms of into Flushing Meadows Corona Park, um, we are working, uh, we're going to be starting and, and looking at Flushing Meadows Corona Park and um, using the uh, PDC approved uh, wayfinding signage, um, doing a comprehensive plan for Flushing Meadows Corona Park, which will include, uh, and this is separate from the Passerelle project, but related because it will include every aspect of the park, including the Passerelle. So, um, so those are uh, two things um, in, in terms of wayfinding. Um, in terms of concessions, um, so that's, uh, we have concessions already in the park. Um, there's a concession at David Dinkin Circle. Um, and once um, the project is completed, we can always look to see if, um, you know, if there's going to be uh, interest. Um, but as of now, um, Right, it's a pedestrian bridge. We don't expect to have any concessions on the bridge um, at this point. Um, in terms of flags, um, yes, I mean, so 
during the US Open, we have uh, American flags that are displayed, but we haven't, um, the right now we're just showing flag poles. And there are opportunities for what types of flags um, could be shown. Um, and um, it, that's something that I think is also a little bit more fluid um, because there's also opportunities for maybe um, temporary art, temporary flags that are artwork. You know, like there's, um, so we're right now, we're, we're not really proposing what type of flags um, will be going, but generally we do, um, during the US Open in particular, we do display um, American flags. But um, but like I said, there there's opportunity for other types of flags to be displayed. Um, and then, um, oh, and sorry, flag poles. Um, there, I, I guess I'll uh, turn this over to Michal, um, if you could address the flag poles. Uh, so yeah, the, the flagpole layout actually matches existing. Maybe uh, I'm not sure which area was that, uh, that that seemed like without the flagpoles, but we actually studied, we counted all of them, and we provided the uh, same number of flags and same distance between the flags itself. So the flagpole layout is the same as the historic, but adjusted to uh, the pastoral uh, alignment that is slightly different than the existing. The spacing is the same. And also relationship, they always, they always pair, they always place in pairs. So we're always passing through two flagpoles as you go down the pass row. Thank you. There, <clears throat> any other commissioners who have questions or comments? I just think that's a great idea about the flagpoles, trying out different flags or using a place platform for artistic art interpretations of flags too. It seems to resonate with the historical aspect of it being kind of both expo site and resonates with Queens being, I think one of the most diverse areas in the world. So I think that's a great idea. Yeah, and, and during the World's Fair, there were international flags. So again, I'm not like, we're not proposing what exactly, what flags will be there you know, when it's built, but yes, I mean, there, there are those opportunities um, available. There's probably more countries today though than there were during the World's Fair. So that could be um, challenging. Um, uh, any other? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that um, there is room for a person for art to, um, or time for them to propose something if it's available or not, I'm not sure. So this is uh, Nancy from Parks, and for the um, Parks uh, city-funded work, we typically work with the Department of Culture Affairs and pick a bunch of projects to go forward, and we have a bunch, we have several coming forward um, soon, some uh, recreation centers, and this uh, site we were really thinking of, um, we had talked about the temporary art and the flagpoles. Um, so this isn't a location that the two agencies chose together for public art, but we do have some some other um, good locations coming. And uh, Flushing Meadow Park is a, a big location for um, percent for art. So I'm sure, you know, this has a platform, I mean, for temporary art. So this is a platform um, outside of the crowds of the USTA is, it's definitely a possibility. Thank you. So as I understand it, um, the wayfinding will be presented more thoroughly at another meeting. Is that is that correct, Nancy and Mira? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So I uh, would someone. So I'm going to just summarize by saying that I think that uh, the uh, commissioners are comfortable with the project as presented, uh, and uh, look forward to uh, further information about. Uh, your wayfinding um, strategy and aesthetic, uh, as well as, um, uh, I know we can't opine on your temporary art, but um, we, we certainly uh, want to support uh, enlivening that visually as you walk down the, the, the passerelle. So would someone like to make a, a motion to approve with any, I, I don't think there are really any conditions other than coming back with wayfinding. Second. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Signe, I do want to mention that we had, a, we had asked for details on uh, detailed drawings on the bridge 
fencing. Uh, so that would be part of the next submission along with updates on the building uh, restoration. Okay, thank you. Um, and also I, do, I guess I, I should probably just clarify on the drawing, I think it was uh, page 30 uh, that showed the eight foot high uh, fence. There, there was a, a clip that showed a, a center rail. Uh, go, uh, go back one, sorry. Right. So you see, there's a there's a horizontal rail. I'm I'm assuming from all the other drawings that there is no uh, that there's no horizontal. Uh, that's correct. Okay. There's no horizontal. Yep. Okay. Great. Okay. Perfect. Um, all right. So now we will uh, take a vote. Um, you can approve, reject, table, or abstain. Phil. Approve. Ken Seth. Approve. Lori. Approve. Deborah. Approve. Karen. Approve. Manuel. Approve. Susan. Approve. Ethel, is she back with us? Okay. She hasn't. No? Okay. No. Um, Meryl. Approve. And Mary. Approve. And myself approve. So this is unanimously approved. Congratulations, team. Um, that, Can I just uh, ask one quick question? Which course. is what is what is the time frame? How long is it expected to take to build this? I'm I'm just curious. We're trying to unmute Mira. I'm sorry. We're um, unmuting Mira so she can respond. And I do want to mention that this is a preliminary level approval. So the project will need to return for final approval before construction can begin. It also appears that um, someone from the Port Authority uh, raised their hand. Yep. Um, hi, everyone. This is uh, Matt Desceno with the Port Authority. Um, I can just answer the question on the, the timing. So um, the, the bridge is going to be completed in two phases. Um, so the uh, the portion of the bridge between the transit and railroad stations um, would be completed um, in about 18 months. So that's starting in uh, the third quarter of 2022 um, and then going for about 18 months. And then um, the portion that's directly over the railroad station um, will um, take much longer because the railroad station um, from the track and platforms all the way up is being entirely rebuilt. Um, there's also the air train um, infrastructure going on top there. So um, that portion of the passerelle uh, would not be completed um, until more like three to four years um, after the construction start date. So we would have temporary um, bridging in place around um, that area for the entire duration. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Karen, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. So if there are no further um, questions, uh, I'm going to adjourn the public meeting. Thank you all. <laughs>